Hello and welcome to the third in our series of Insider Talks, where we take a look at the research work being undertaken in the world's leading doctoral institutions. I'm delighted to have ETH et al. Zurich here with us today. Um, and uh, before I, I say any words of introduction, let me just briefly mention what else we have in store this week. Um, on the 15th of April, we have a, a, our talk in Farsi, um, and on the on next on, on the 16th next, next Saturday, we have our session a session in Portuguese, a tutorial in Portuguese. These language sessions have proved to be enormously successful. Um, we're delighted at the at the the number of views we've had for them, and uh, we will be using these as the basis for our summer workshops. Uh, we'll be working less in terms of regional managers and more in terms of language managers over the summer. We, just to say we're in the process of um, beginning to plan for the summer. There will be a similar event to last year that will take place um, at the end of June, beginning of July, with a series of, of uh, with, a, with a series of doctoral uh, consortium uh, lectures, uh, followed by a conference, followed by the opening ceremony, followed by the event itself, and then the closing ceremony. It should be a very spectacular session. Um, so today then is the third, the third in the series um, of our insider talks. Um, uh, the first in the series was one ICD Stuttgart, and the second one was um, MIT Media Lab. Both have proved to be very popular. Um, the YouTube recordings of those of those sessions, um, and this is our third one. Um, ETH Zurich is someone that we we know very well in terms of um, uh, uh, digital futures. Philip Block has been central to many of the conferences over the years, and of course, Gramazio Cola are well known for um, uh, for what they've been doing um, for the last twenty or so years. Um, but, but, but ETH actually has, actually has six different um, professorships or chairs in what they call the Institute of Technology and Architecture. Today I'm going to invite um, Nicola to, um, uh, <coughs> to, to, to say, Nicola Malincic, to say some, some words by way of introduction to the different uh, uh, chairs and the different research going on there. Um, we'll have six presentations, then after the presentations we will have some questions. We've been live streamed on Billy Billy and also YouTube, um, so um, please send through your questions um, uh, when uh, towards the end. Um, so um, I will be joining for the questions, so I'd like to hand over to Nicola. Nicola, it's, it's been wonderful to have you here today, and thank you to you and your team for bringing them um, on to Digital Futures. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. Thank you for inviting us. We are very grateful to be able to present uh, for all of you for these wide in audiences over the internet. So I um, will share my screen slowly. Just a second. Um, all right. Um, my name is Nikola Marincic. I work at ETH Zurich as a lecturer at the Chair of uh, Digital Architectonics and also as the Doctoral Program Coordinator at the Institute of Technology in Architecture. And ETH Zurich, uh, as you might know, it is the best technical university in Switzerland, and it's also eighth in the world um, overall, and fourth in the world for engineering and technology, according to QS World University Rankings for 2022. So in this image, you can see the ETH main building, which is located in Zurich city center. However, most of our facilities are actually located uh, in the Hungerberg campus, which is outside of the city center, um, which is surrounded by forests and beautiful nature. So uh, in pink here, I have actually marked the facilities of the Department of Architecture. And the Department of Architecture is one of the most highly regarded faculties of architecture in the world. The uh, department comprises of uh, five institutes, and today's presentation will be about the Institute of Technology in Architecture, or ETA, or ITA, however you want to call it. So ITA is a bridge between architectural design studies and the building process. So it builds a world leading platform for teaching and the development of pioneering technologies in architecture. The Institute's professorships, they work together in order to shape uh, the future of construction through life size research projects. Uh, you can see our relatively new Institute building on the campus called Architect Lab. And uh, it is most, more than just a building that accommodates us. It is also a research laboratory uh, where various research approaches 
of the chairs and external uh, specialists are applicable. So it is designed to be relevant to construction in the real world with results that flow directly into research and industry. So this is the idea. And you can, here you can see the pictures of our robotic fabrication laboratory, which is located on the ground floor. And we all sit on top of it and do our research. So ITA, it comprises uh, eight professorships. Six of them are involved in the doctoral program. Uh, two of them are not yet. So these are the architecture and digital fabrication, which is also known as Gramatio and Color Research, architecture and structures, also known as Block Research Group, digital building technologies, digital architectonics, architecture and building systems, architecture and building process, structural design, and construction heritage and preservation. So our students today come from various chairs from ITA, and they will showcase just how diverse our work and research is. So we are not one group of people who, who is working um, incredibly close together. We are relatively separate, have our own freedoms, have our own kind of ideas how things should look like, how they should develop. So it's kind of individuals uh, with different ideas jo joining together to work together. So this, this is a video that we made for ETA's 10 year anniversary in 2019. Uh, you can see our building uh, and then you can see this parametric roof designed by Gramatio and Kohler Research, some tile vaulting experiments by Block Research Group. And um, you can also see the 3D printed slab. Uh, then you can see the map or the atlas for building process, which is developed a chair for building systems, uh, for building processes. Then uh, algorithmically designed and printed 3D columns by digital building technologies, as you can see here. It's, uh, also see smart adaptive facades developed by the chair of uh, building systems. Then um, AI floor plan uh, search engine, which is developed by uh, DBT and also application of AI in architecture of the chair of digital architectonics and also many books that we have published. Uh, among the projects are also the mesh mold, which is robotically fabricated uh, framework from Gramatio and Kohler research and also many other projects involving robotic fabrication from the same chair. Um, apart from the robotic fabrication, we also have uh, worked with the Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore uh, in many urban uh, projects. But also we have used technologies such as uh, VR in data visualization and similar topics. I'm sorry if the video is a little bit late. This is Knit Candela, a thin concrete shell built on an ultra-light uh, knitted formwork and also fabri uh, robotic fabrication of jammed architectural structures and many other projects from Gramatio Kohler Research. This is quasi-crystal quasi -crystal design by Digital Architectonics and also aerial construction with robots, among many other things that we do. So this was all done before 2019. And today you will have a chance to learn about the new research from our doctoral students, which brings us to our doctoral program at ITA that I'm coordinating. So the Architecture and Technology doctoral program, this is our interdisciplinary educational platform, which is committed to teaching and training scholars in research uh, of technology in architecture. And the program is offered and managed collaboratively by six ITA professorships. And their work assimilates many diverse aspects of employing science, technology, and engineering in architecture, including, for example, computational design of buildings and structures, building processes and systems, digital and robotic construction and fabrication, and many, many others. So at any time, we have over 50 plus international doctoral students. And something really unique about us is that we also offer uh, three paid full-time scholarships every year. So this is the link. Um, of our uh, doctoral program fellowship. And I will now just stop my presentation to show you how to get there. So the easiest way would be to just uh, Google uh, ETA, ETH, ITA, ETH. This should uh, bring you to our homepage. In our homepage, there is a doctoral program and then how to apply. 
in how to apply you have all the information about the doctoral program that we it lasts for three and a half years it's fully funded and it starts on october uh, 2023 you can see the chairs that are involved you can see the application process and there will be more information because our application uh, applications for the fellowship for 2022 has already been finished a few months ago and we will soon i mean relatively soon open the application for 2023 fellowships it will open in september 2022 so on this page you can find uh the application link when it when it comes or also you can find it on our jobs page which you can do by clicking uh, find by clicking here or just going to jobs it will appear here so uh that's it from my side this is what i wanted to show you uh, and also what we offer to show you what we offer so you can all apply if you're interested and now uh, i would like to actually introduce our um, presenters our doctoral students and they can showcase their work so the first uh, uh, presenter will be joanna uh, mitropoulou and she's a doctoral researcher at ita uh, at the chair of digital building technologies at eth zurich and her current research focuses on developing a digital workflow for the design and fabrication of non-planner uh, print pads for advanced robotic addit additive manufacturing. Uh, she, received, received, sorry, she received her Master of Architecture from the National Technical University of Athens in 2017, and then subsequently completed the Fab Academy uh, in the Fab Lab of IAC Barcelona 2017, and the Mass Master of Advanced Studies in Architecture and Digital Fabrication at ETH in 2018. Her professional experience includes a year of work on procedural urban design using virtual reality tools at S3 Research and Development Zurich. So, Joanna, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? No. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, looks good. Okay. Is it full screen? Yes, yes, it's full screen. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay, uh, okay, so hello from my side as well. Um, so I am uh, Iana Metropoulou and today I'm going to talk about my research with the title non planar layered uh, morphologies. Um, so I received my Diploma of Architecture uh, from Athens. I also studied in Paris and in Barcelona, and then I came here in Zurich where I have been for the last few years. Um, at the moment, I'm doing my uh, PhD research here. I have this uh, three years ETA scholarship. I am part of the TBT team that is led by Benjamin Dillenburger, and I'm working on uh, robotic 3D printing. And uh, now is a very exciting time to be working on 3D printing uh, because lately it has become more and more common to take the 3D printing process out of the 3D printing box uh, by attaching the print head on a robotic arm, as you see on the right. And this opens up some uh, great new potential for architecture because not only can we print bigger objects, but we can also take advantage of the flexibility of the robotic arm in order to create more complex uh, geometries. Uh, so inspired by this, uh, this is the work, the research question that I started with. So most printed processes involve uh, these planar layers that have constant layer height. But once we start using the robots, we don't have to use planar layers anymore. So I posed the question, uh, what happens once we raise this constraint of planarity and start exploring the world of uh, curved layers? Uh, what uh, kind of print paths can we design? How can we design them? So with which methods and what type of problems can we solve like that? And um, the methods that I am developing for designing print paths are based on the following idea. So there is one uh, parameterization function that is at the base of everything. So I create a function on the surface and then the paths are always described as the isolines of this function. The isolines are curved uh, along which the value of the function remains constant. 
And as you can see on the image, I'm working with discrete surfaces, in particular triangle meshes, where the function is uh, defined on the vertices. Um, so I control the path through a, a discrete function. And then the question becomes, uh, how do we create this function? And this is the main question of my research. And today I'm going to show two methodologies that I have developed for creating this function. One that relies on boundaries, uh, so it's controlled by boundaries, and one that is controlled by a vector field. Um, so the first and simplest one uses boundaries as a control medium to, um, to generate print paths. And, um, oops, sorry, wrong direction. And the idea here is quite straightforward. So we define some target curves, usually on the boundaries, and then in between we get intermediate curves that interpolate the boundaries as best as possible. So the result in the end looks like this. So it's quite intuitive and easy to understand how it works, and also it's very easy to implement. And this method works particularly well for branching geometries, where the paths uh, follow the orientation of the axis of every branch. However, the simplicity of this method also causes its most important disadvantages. So we have direct control on the areas where we add the constraints, but what happens in between? Um, we can only control the in-between space indirectly, and there often um, issues can come up, so things can go wrong. And these images show some examples of how this can happen. So it can happen that we don't have um, a, a uniform distribution of paths, and so the result is not suitable for 3D printing. Which brings me to the second method, the, the function that is controlled by a vector field, which offers more flexibility and more extensive control. But in return, it's also more um, intensive computationally and harder to implement. Um, so this time we control the path through a vector field. To generate the vector field, we uh, start with some constraints. Here you can see, can you see my mouse? Um, I am pointing, perfect. Um, so here you can see the constraints in red, and then we generate a vector field that respects those constraints while being as smooth as possible. And then the question is, how can we get paths from these vectors? And the first thought might be to use an agent-based approach. Um, so we can have some small entities that walk along the vector field, and then we keep track of their uh, trajectory. And unfortunately, the curves that are generated with, with this method are not really useful for 3D printing. And the reason is that um, with this method, we only have local control over the direction of every curve. So there is no easy way to control the spacing between different curves, and we cannot guarantee a relatively uniform global distribution on the surface. Uh, so what we are doing instead is that we consider the vector field as the gradient of a parameterization function. And as usual, the print paths are the isolines of that function. So the process is here. We get the vector field, then we integrate it into a function, and then we trace the isolines of that function to get the print path. And now the relation of, uh, between uh, original vector field and resulting print path is that uh, the paths uh, that you see in red, they are always vertical to the original vector field, and the magnitude of the vector field controls the spacing of the paths. Um, yeah, so this allows us to generate a distribution of paths that is feasible. And what we have gained is that um, now we have control over the entire surface, so not just the boundaries. So we can create patterns like this, where, which would not be possible if we only could uh, add constraints on the boundaries. Um, Okay, so I've presented some methods for generating paths, but up to this point, these paths were just uh, curves in the digital world. Um, and now I will briefly describe the process of turning them into physical objects. Um, since we are printing cell geometries, the first thing we need to consider is the surface thickness. Um, and we've been using two ways for creating thickness, either by offsetting uh, what you see on the left, so simple offsets, or by creating a double shell that is connected through these ribs, what you see on the right. And so far, the double shell is our preferred way. 
Um, not only because it uses less material and so it creates a more lightweight object, but also because it creates this um, interesting surface pattern, which I find very beautiful and also has a structural meaning. Um, then another issue that comes up is that um, unavoidably not all objects can be printed in one piece. Um, so we have various segmentation strategies for splitting the geometry in pieces that are printed separately and then assembled in a post process. And we've also looked into different connection strategies and in this slide you can see one of them. Um, so here we are creating these L shapes uh, on the both sides and then these can be slided together and connected, taking advantage of this common area of the pieces. And this is what the final, the connections look like after the assembly of the pieces. Uh, the fabrication setup uh, that was used, you, that was used for creating all these examples is in this picture. So we have a European robot that is mounted from above. And this is a snapshot from the printing process. So it is very useful to have the robot mounted from above because this gives us enough space to reorient the, the print head around the object, which is uh, necessary for non-planar printing. And um, yeah, what you can see here is that um, we are, in order to print the pieces, we are also creating at the beginning a small sacrificial support. And the way we are doing it is we print the support, then we let it cool down, and then we print the piece on top. So this creates a cold joint between the piece, the original piece, and the sacrificial base. And uh, so this is like the weakest connection of the piece. So what happens is that if we apply a bit of pressure, this is the first spot where the piece will break. And then, uh, so like this, we can remove the piece from the base without any need for, um, for additional post-processing. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, here you can see some final, uh, the, the final piece after the assembly, this was created using six pieces and uh, it was assembled with hot glue. And this is a laser piece that we created that we assembled using screws. And needless to say that screws work much better than hot glue. And so in all the future prototypes, um, yeah, we will be using screws. Um, yeah, uh, so now I'm getting to the end of my presentation. Um, I presented some methods for uh, generating and fabricating non-planar print paths. And um, all of this work is ongoing research. So none of this is really final. It's a work in progress uh, that is happening now. And the next steps would be um, scaling up the 3D printing process and also bringing it, applying it into a more tangible architectural context. So bringing it within um, a building, finding an application where it is suitable and uh, developing a demonstrator that solves its potential within architecture. Uh, yeah, that's it from my side. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. We are a presentation. Um, the, as far as I understood, we will first um, Go with our presentations and then the questions and answers will be happening at the end so which means that we will now continue and our next presenter is barat shashadri and he holds mechanical engineering degrees from the national university of singapore and the nanyang technological university and his work uh, experience includes integrated high performance building design building energy systems and his phd is focused on fabricating bespoke heat transfer components to realize zero carbon building energy systems. So Bharat, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola, for that nice introduction and a nice uh, summary of my research. And thank you to um, Neil and the rest of the Digital Futures uh, um, team uh, for having me here. It's a nice opportunity to uh, discuss our research and show you a little, um, give you a little sneak peek of what we do at ETA and ETH. I'm going to share my screen quickly. I hope you can see it now. Yes, looks good. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, as Nicola mentioned, um, uh, I have my background is in mechanical engineering and specifically in HVAC systems. So before starting this PhD, I was working as an HVAC engineer in Singapore. Um, HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. Um, so this was mostly what I was doing for five years in Asia, uh, which was designing uh, air conditioning and cooling and uh, heating ventilation systems uh, for commercial and residential buildings. It looks very simple. The theory is very simple, but once you get into the details, it uh, gets complicated very quickly. But the main objective for me and for other uh, HVAC engineers was to maintain thermal comfort and good air quality inside buildings while at the same time um, trying to reduce the uh, carbon impact of new and existing buildings by using more efficient energy systems. It was, uh, it was an interesting process um, because what we would do was uh, first the architect would design the building, very nice, the form, the geometry, uh, the building materials, and then he would just give this design over to us and we would just try and cram all our systems inside this building which theoretically doesn't make any sense because there's no integration or inclusion of both uh, processes inside this entire architectural design. But nonetheless, it was very important because the whole motivation for my work and my current research was that um, buildings kind of account for uh, one third of the global CO2 emissions and HVAC systems is the largest contributor between 40 to 70% of uh, operational CO2 emissions in buildings. So um, uh, roughly 15% of global CO2 emissions come from HVAC systems. So um, it's a very important or um, uh, the impact we have in our, uh, in, in, in our field can be felt massively for the global CO2 emissions. So this is the motivation um, for my research. Uh, so the question for me um, uh, was that I come from this HVAC MEP background and coming into ETA, which is uh, world renowned for robotic architecture and changing the paradigm of how uh, we design, fabricate and construct or even think about buildings. Uh, my question was, um, can we design and fabricate building structures which make HVAC systems either redundant completely or at least reduce the dependency on HVAC systems to maintain comfort? Um, in the 19th century, um, HVAC systems were mostly uh, either buildings with a massive fireplace or in hotter climates, just naturally ventilated or naturally cooled. And in the 28th century, when we started uh, more uh, sophisticated engineering mechanisms, we kind of crammed all sorts of complicated machines inside our building to make people feel comfortable without caring much for complexity, operational redundancy, or even um, CO2 emissions. But now, as we enter the digital era where we kind of can fabricate buildings with um, robots, the question now is, can we integrate this whole thermal comfort, indoor air quality and energy concept into the robotic fabrication process of a building? So that is pretty much um, uh, my motivation uh, for, what, for what I've been doing at ETA. So, one element which I focused on, which I would talk about today, was to incorporate the use of um, 3D printed heat pipes or elements that transport thermal energy without any mechanical action. The, um, the idea would be that if you can actually build or 3D print a heat pipe um, into building structures, you could have variable heat transfer facade elements, which means that your facade can selectively act as an excellent thermal insulator or a conductor. So for example, on a sunny winter day, it can transfer any kind of solar radiation that falls on the facade into uh, the inside of the building, thus making heating systems uh, redundant, or at least it reduces the dependency on heating systems. Another idea would be to transfer heat without any mechanical action from different parts of the building. For example, if you have a warm part of the building, you could transfer that heat to colder parts of the building, thus maintaining thermal equilibrium. Um, across the entire uh, building envelope or um, floor. Um, the concept is very simple of a heat pipe. Um, there's a tiny bit of liquid inside a hollow chamber and it kind of absorbs heat on one section 
and condenses at a colder section. Um, and so which means that it achieves thermal equilibrium or it transfers heat effectively, efficiently um, without the use of a motor or a mechanical action. So it's simple. This is a simple simulation of what I'm talking about. It takes the left-hand side shows you the liquid fraction that evaporates and condenses along the entire section of the heat pipe. And the right side shows you how it achieves thermal equilibrium or it uh, effectively transfers heat throughout the section of the heat pipe um, using this kind of a mechanism. But what I didn't tell you is that this kind of technology is, is almost like 70, 80 years old, has been implemented in um, cooling electronic applications, uh, aeronautical applications, and many such. Um, the, 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 the troublesome point of incorporating something like this in building applications is that in order to evaporate and condense um, liquid or vapor inside these kind of systems, you need to maintain um, vacuum. So inside this is a is, there's no there's no air. All the air inside this tube has been sucked out. So that's the tricky part of uh, realizing such a uh, effective uh, thermal transfer mechanism. So this is a simple uh, again um, thermal image to show you how this works. Um, so for example, on the left side you see that this is a simple heat pipe, but all the air is inside is still present. And so there's a massive temperature difference between the heat source and the heat sink. And on the right side, when you evacuate the entire heat pipe and there's no air inside water or any kind of liquid evaporates at very low temperatures and supplies heat to the rest of the heat pipe very effectively. So it's almost nearly impossible to achieve in a 3D printed object because nobody has really 3D printed um, a vacuum tight device um, on a large scale. And nobody has done it for polymer 3D printing. So the most effective or the most popular heat pipe mechanisms are made out of metal because metal has excellent gas barrier properties and it's impossible for, or very close to, it's, it's not possible for air to escape into or through a metal. So most uh, heat pipes in different applications are made out of metal, aluminum, copper, iron, um, and, Polymer applications are very limited and definitely, definitely not 3D printed polymer applications. But because uh, we are ETA and we are focused on um, uh, robotic fabrication outside of just a simple box, and we're also talking about large scale fabrication, it makes sense to, to make these kind of uh, uh, heat transfer components only out of polymers. So what I've done for the last year or so is to find a way um, to 3D print polymers without any kind of post-processing that's completely vacuum tight. So I chose a liquid crystal polymer. This means that it uh, has both properties um, of a liquid as well as the long-term crystal order. And what happens to this material as you extrude it out of a 3D printer is that the polymer chains, which as you can see in the top figure here in, in figure B are oriented in all sorts of different directions because of the heat <clears throat> and mechanical stresses of the extruder, they start orienting themselves in a single direction. And because of that, they become incredibly strong um, in this particular direction, as you can see. So this is like a microscopic image of a wall of a 3D printed heat pipe that you see here. And on the right side, you see the, it's a graphical representation of how all, all these polymer chains being oriented in a single direction, which means that it can withstand um, the pressure caused by the differences in air pressure on the inside and the outside. And also it's able to kind of have very high gas barrier property. So it does not allow air to pass through them at all. Thus ensuring that without any kind of post-processing, it can withstand vacuum pressures and it does not allow any kind of exfiltration or infiltration um, through the walls of this container. So, most of this, the research which I've done in the last few months is to realize how I can produce um, a robust 3D printed heat pipe. So I played around with different, um, uh, different properties like uh, nozzle temperature, um, uh, layer heights, layer widths, and even layer thickness. And I found a way to 3D print um, this liquid crystal polymer which, with ultra thin um, walls less than 0.5 millimeters uh, in thickness. Um, and currently we're printing very small stuff that's 20 to 30 centimeters large. 
that can withstand vacuum pressures. So because of this, you're able to create FDM polymer 3D printed vacuum tight elements for the first time. And the applications are pretty significant and enormous. Um, this work was done in collaboration with a startup um, at, uh, at uh, ETH called Nematex, which produces this kind of a material and filament. Um, so it's a pretty significant achievement for both of us that we're able to achieve, uh, I think, the world's first 3D printed polymer uh, heat pipe. So we've also been prototyping, um, and this is a simple thermal image which you see, which uh, the 3D printed polymer pipe, which achieves a near uniform surface temperature within three minutes. So it can effectively be engineered to transfer heat like a metal and achieve a thermal conductivity almost 200 times the value of the base material. And of course, uh, we also, like the previous speaker, Iona mentioned, we also are working on multi-axis 3D printing. So we don't have to limit the application of these kind of superconductors um, to a single tube or planar surface, but actually uh, focus on different kinds of geometries, work on different kinds of geometries. And this is an image also of during this heat pipe effect. Um, we've done helixes, spirals, and double curb heat pipes um, showing the cap this capability of heat spreading and variable thermal conductivity as well. So the next step for my research is to scale this up to um, uh, the facade or uh, building system scale to use the freedom of geometry that 3D printing allows us um, to engineer heat transfer elements for the next generation of, uh, of uh, buildings. And I think with that, I close my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bharat. Could you maybe uh, stop the screen sharing? Thanks a lot. Um, our next presenter is Susanna Kramer Greenbaum, and uh, she's a PhD research fellow at ETH Zurich in the Institute for Architecture and Technology. And her research studies the impacts of new housing construction on neighborhood change uh, in the Zurich agglomeration. She is also a licensed architect with experience uh, leading large scale and urban redevelopment projects in the US and also internationally. And she also has an undergraduate degree in architectural history. So, Susanna, the floor is yours. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, is that good? You can see it? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Great. Um, so, hi, and thank you for the opportunity to present this research. Um, my research studies the impacts of new housing construction on neighborhood change in the Zurich agglomeration. Um, and so for some, some context in Zurich, there's a um, two sort of combined problems for the housing market. One is an exceptionally low vacancy rate, as anyone who has tried to find an apartment in Zurich will probably know that um, the vacancy rate is below 0.5% within the city. And sort of typically below 2% in the, the city region, um, which is extremely low at 5% is considered a sort of workable housing market. Um, and Zurich is well, well below that. And this uh, problem is combined with the fact that Switzerland has an exceptionally high population of renters for Europe, um, and especially within the Zurich city area, it's even higher. Um, so these two problems together um, put an extreme amount of pressure on the housing markets in Zurich. Um, which the city is aware of. And so they have instituted in the past 20 years a number of building agendas or initiatives to try to address this problem and stimulate the building, the construction of new housing. So starting in about 2000, there was a campaign to build 10,000 new units in 10 years, which is you know, it's 20 years later, still somewhat ongoing, um, as well as a campaign, a somewhat ambitious campaign to increase the percentage of affordable housing in the city um, from about a quarter to about a third, which is also ongoing and has had some sort of medium success so far. Also, the city anticipates an increased population in the next 20 years. Um, and so partly to accommodate for that, the city released 
in the past few years, a structural plan designed to guide the city towards the densification in its building, built environment required um, for the, um, required to accommodate the new population coming into the city. And this plan, um, so you can see the, the imagery for the plan here and the areas shown in red are the target areas for densification across the city of Zurich. So this, this plan um, is extremely political and very highly polarized, part of a very highly polarized debates within Zurich. Um, just this past fall, there was strong enough opposition to the plan to trigger a public referendum voting on whether or not the plan could be approved for the city of Zurich. Um, and so there was obviously uh, different political campaigns and parties and camps on both sides of the issue, saying the plan would promote sort of what's more bike friendly, more green space, as well as the needed densification, different newspapers in the city took different sides. Um, the anti-camp um, disseminated a lot of images of this sort of very scary, you can see on the, um, on the right, this sort of very scary sort of looming skyline over the recognizable city of Zurich, trying to convince people that it would sort of irrevocably change the city for the worse. Um, but this whole discussion of densification and the construction of new housing to accommodate an, an anticipated increase in population took place in a very, very uh, politicized environment. Um, so one thing I found in this discussion, but also in uh, practice as an architect is that there's not really a great amount of quantitative research looking at what the impact of large scale housing developments in urban areas really is. There's an extensive amount of research on it, um, but it tends to be case-based and it tends to focus on um, cases that have attracted attention because of a particular phenomenon going on. So there's a bit of an outlier bias in the literature talking only about areas where extreme change might be taking place um, relative to new housing construction. So my research question asks, sort of what's the impact of large scale housing development on city residents in the Zurich agglomeration sort of broadly across every neighborhood, not cherry picking neighborhoods where there's a sort of already known or documented phenomenon taking place. So um, part of the reason Zurich is a great option for this to add a sort of quantitative layer to this research question is um, one, they've been building a lot of housing for the past 20 years. So there's a good chance to see sort of what effect that housing has had. And also um, Switzerland and Zurich both have excellence microdata, they have individual annual, annually collected data that tracks people's movements, as well as a number of demographic statistics and their socioeconomic status as well. So there's um, an extremely, it's an extremely data rich environment um, that allows for a quantitative analysis of these sorts of movements that isn't always possible in other cities. Um, so I'm using that and I'm also using a number, of, the city of Zurich, implements a biannual data on resident satisfaction that asks a lot of questions about how people perceive their neighborhood, how they perceive changes, whether these uh, how they perceive changes in the composition of their neighborhood, whether these are good or bad and what to what causes they might attribute these changes. And I conducted a survey of my own probing those questions in a bit more depth as well. Um, I'm combining quantitative and qualitative methods. So it's, it's primarily quantitative, but um, as this is a causal question, some qualitative understanding of sort of what causes people are attributing to changes that they see is important, uh, an important layer. So when you ask people about housing construction and its impact on neighborhood change, there's, there's very strong popular perceptions, um, often negative. People tend to associate it with an increased turnover or a less stable population, more people coming and going, increased displacements of existing residents, um, densification, which in, in Zurich is either a call to arms or for many people sort of a dirty word. It's something that they don't want to see. It's a sort of fear that the city will change beyond recognition. Um, people associate new housing construction with gentrification of their neighborhoods as well as pluralization. So while some people fear um, their neighborhoods sort of homogenizing towards a gentrified population, um, another set of people fear their neighborhood pluralizing to a more economically diverse population as well. Um, but obviously this relationship is not so simple. Um, so, this is um, a sort of diagram of the numerous different relationships between these factors that I have been studying in this research. And I'm not gonna go through the entire diagram right now because obviously there's a lot here, but I wanted to call attention to a couple of, a couple of key findings from this, which is that in Zurich, um, the type of funding model or type of development model for housing matters a lot in terms of what type of effect it's having. So the government housing agenda has spurred new construction from primarily from two different entities, from developer interest, 
sometimes in private, public private partnerships, um, but also in cooperative housing, which is a sort of Zerk specific, well, I mean, it happens elsewhere, but the percentage of housing that's cooperative in Zerk is very, very high um, compared to most other cities. And these two different types of funding models for housing had an extremely different impact on their um, on the, the changes taking place around the new housing. Likewise, the type of housing um, was quite different. There's um, renovation or replacement housing when an existing building is torn down or renovated to the extent that the existing residents are asked to leave. It's sort of gut renovation. Um, and then there's new housing construction. And pulling these apart is also extremely important to understand because a replacement housing necessitates the displacement. The existing residents have to leave. Their housing is just disappearing. Um, whereas new housing construction doesn't. Um, so what I, and as of right now, re replacement housing is a much smaller percentage of the new construction in Zurich than new housing construction is, although there's some, some signs that suggest that this might be changing moving forward. But as of right now, um, mostly what's happening is new housing construction. So infill housing or brownfield housing or greenfield housing in some cases. And so, um, what I found was that the new housing construction actually has a pretty strong relationship to neighborhoods that were stabilizing over time. So where there was a lot of new building, the neighborhood population was much more stable than in areas that were sort of similar socioeconomically, but did not have new construction, which again, sort of goes against a lot of the existing research, but a lot of the existing research focuses on outlier neighborhoods where a sort of visible or change is taking place. Um, new housing construction necessarily leads to densification also if there's, it brings additional residents to the area which is one of the primary drivers of socioeconomic and demographic changes in neighborhoods in Zurich. So new housing is causing a sort of compositional change in neighborhoods, but it really isn't causing uh, residents to be displaced. It's actually causing more of the existing residents to stay in place than in other areas. I found that new housing construction had absolutely no correlation to gentrification at the regional scale, at the city scale, or at the neighborhood scale. Gentrification is certainly taking place within areas of Zurich, but this, this really um, appeared pretty unrelated to new housing construction. Um, although new housing construction did have a relationship to pluralization to a more economically diverse, socioeconomically diverse population in neighborhoods where new housing was being built, that often the new housing would bring people into the neighborhood who were different than the people who had been there before. Oh, Joe, my son has woken up. Um, I'll be very quick and wrap this up. And the biggest problem, so, and people's perceptions of displacement or instability in their neighborhood <laughs> or negative associations were all with where new construction was taking place, which were not where the changes they talked about were taking place. So primarily people were upset about new housing construction and they sort of mapped that onto an understanding that all of these ne uh, negative changes were taking place in their environment, but it actually, they weren't happening in the same place. So there's, I think the sort of shorthand conclusion is that um, new housing construction, at least in the Zurich context really has a PR problem that there's a very, all these really strong negative perceptions about it, but the changes that people are concerned about are not happening or, or often mitigated where new housing is taking place. Um, so the contribution this makes is really tries to add a quantitative layer to something to try to smooth the outlier bias in the existing literature. And sorry for the interruption, but Saturday afternoon, waking up cranky from a nap. So um, I think I'm going to end there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Susanna, for your presentation. Um, we will be going forward. The next on our list is Ines Ariza, and she's an architect and researcher passionate about how small and large things connect. She's currently a PhD candidate at ETH Zurich, working on new concepts and methods for details and detailing when using robots in the loop. So she holds degrees in architecture, design, and computation from the University of Buenos Aires, 2011, and MIT, 2016. And since October 2017, Ines has led the project Adaptive Detailing, uh, Design and Fabrication Methods for In-Place WAAM Connection Details at Gramazio Color Research, which is also the chair of architecture and digital fabrication at ETH Zurich. So Ines, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, moment. Can you see my screen full screen? Yes. yes. Super. Okay. So hello everyone, and thank you so much for um, the opportunity to present the research in this venue. Uh, so yeah, I'm a PhD researcher at Ramazzo Research and also an ETA fellow. 
So uh, a little bit of my background, I am an architect um, uh, from the University of Buenos Aires, where I, um, um, there I focus on a lot of materials and I was teaching morphology and I also work on construction particularly. And then uh, I went back to academia after <laughs> being a professional. I uh, went to study computation where I focus on digital fabrication and um, I did a master's thesis focused on details and detailing. I saw the opportunity of using computation to deconstructing what a detail is into simple rules that uh, can help us uh, build new things, uh, but basically yeah, uh, solve spe specific problems like uh, stability of the structures or uh, assembly. So this topic was uh, what brought me to ETH. And uh, so especially this ETA fellowship uh, gave me the opportunity to focus on this topic on a different context, which is uh, what about detailing for robots? Uh, so that's uh, why I came to Grammatical Research uh, to do this PhD uh, that is called Adaptive Detailing. Um, so yeah, so the topic or the answer, uh, the question that I want to answer is uh, what about detailing for robots? And uh, so there are a lot of things that change when we uh, uh, design and build with robots. Um, one uh, aspect that we can start with is this uh, change from being uh, giving instructions to someone to do something but not being super uh, explicit about it and then uh, giving instructions to a machine where we need to know exactly what the machine can do. And this entails, of course, uh, our, uh, our role of understanding exactly what the machine can do to actually be able to design a detail with a machine. So uh, I focus this question on um, the context of robotic assembly and in particular uh, of uh, spatial structures, which is one uh, big topic of grammatical research. And this brings us to joining, which is the actual thing that uh, robots do um, to actually um, connect parts. So uh, here, the state of the art uh, shows uh, a lot of options for joining uh, spatial structures. We have uh, different strategies from uh, robot-human collaboration, so the robots hold pieces and the humans join them, uh, to uh, multifunctional end effectors that can do everything, like, for example, placing parts and cutting them and then uh, joining them, and uh, also other strategies such as uh, distributed or collaborative strategies where the robots um, have uh, collaborate and do uh, tasks uh, like assembly and joining together. So uh, from this state of the art and identify uh, these big topics or just the starting point of, to understand what is detailing for robotic assembly. And uh, so I have these three big things, uh, which is first of all, we need to understand uh, the ground. So we need to prepare to design for these machines. And this uh, means understanding very well the robotic setup. In one part and another thing is understanding these spatial interfaces that have become quite complex. Uh, and then understanding the joining tasks per se, which also entails other things like, for example, asking what kind of materials and techniques are actually suitable for this. And uh, yeah, so what are the functions? Uh, of course, we have the function of supporting, so connecting parts so they stay in place, and the actual uh, how we accomplish that things are actually connected, which is uh, basically joining to fit things in place. And then the combination of all these things or the, the integration of this and, um, and the negotiation sometimes of this, uh, all these other problems, uh, is what we call detailing. So paraphrasing uh, Papert, uh, so we can't really think about uh, detailing or joining uh, without really thinking about joining something. So I focus on a topic that the chair has developed in the past, which is uh, lightweight um, uh, structures in steel developed by Stefana Parascio before me. And then here, uh, this is a very complex <laughs> construction system which was assembled with uh, cooperative robots, but joined or welded by hand. So I switched to ask the question of where, okay, how do we do this robotically? And I use a 3D printing method, which is called wire and additive manufacturing or WAM, which uh, you might know because of this super famous, amazing project, MX3D Bridge uh, that was open last year. And uh, yeah, so this is exactly the same printing technique. Uh, the difference is that um, instead of printing the whole thing, uh, we aim to use it as, as a connector piece. So only print the part that needs to be best spoke or 
uh, or need to uh, fit in between other things. So we use it on top of in between other elements. So we call it in place one, so in EP uh, one. And then the PhD went on to investigate what kind of details and detailing we need to, um, to, to actually connect things with this technique. So I'll go through a couple of concepts that I, uh, or methods that I've been working on. Uh, again, with all these uh, big topics that I introduced at the beginning, the first one is um, the understanding of the robotic setup. And for here, because we are printing in between things, we actually need to map what the tool can actually do in between uh, the elements. So the first thing is to, uh, to, to map, yeah, to, to get uh, the tool around the elements to understand what is actually accessible, but not only for the tool, not only for the geometry of the tool, but also what the robot can do. So this actually uh, gets um, uh, summarized in what we call the reachability map, which is a map of um, how uh, reachable is the space around the elements uh, where we can actually design. Uh, and to this is very related to the type of interface that we have, because of course we can uh, <laughs> implicitly understand a lot of things for simple interfaces like planar interfaces, but uh, when we have complex interfaces, uh, we actually need methods to uh, understand and visualize that. So these maps uh, and, and other methods to, to interpret and visualize and be able to design uh, in that space and that design space uh, is something that we need to take into account. So I go to investigate this uh, option. There is a, a video. So it's uh, this technique is actually uh, manipulating the material from solid to liquid to solid again. So it's a very big uh, challenge to actually control it. Uh, yeah, and for that, uh, we actually had to do a lot of uh, uh, testing and uh, I had the, the luck to be able to collaborate with other chairs at ETH Zurich. That's an amazing thing that uh, this uh, fellowship allows is to be able to be in this environment. And uh, yeah, together with the chair of um, steel and composites and uh, durability of materials, we went to understand the um, mechanical behavior and the corrosion behavior of this type of new material. When this, this brings us to uh, using again this design space uh, that we created, understanding the robot capabilities to actually uh, map the tendencies of the, the weight or the, the where the material distribution should be, should be uh, uh, or what shape the material should be taking place. So it's very the opposite of actually drawing something that uh, we have in mind or, or by catalog, but actually using the constraints of the, of the reachability map to actually uh, map where the material should be placed. Inside this space, of course, we can uh, then uh, find an actual path that we can print. And again, uh, con in con consideration of more uh, material and um, reachability constraints. So it gets actually much more complicated. But then, uh, yes, the, the actual problem is now, how do we actually build this? And here is a, a, a new concept, which is, um, compared to conventional detailing, where we actually plan everything in advance and then we go and build. So building uh, computationally, computationally, um, computationally uh, designed uh, detailing changes the way uh, how we connect the design and the, and the building. So we don't need to actually uh, bake a detail in advance, but we can always be in control of what's happening during production. So for that, uh, I'm not sure if these videos will play, they were a bit uh, funky, but basically we the, the way we do that is by using sensors, by measuring the parts before we print and during printing to actually accommodate the materials to uh, what uh, needs to be um, printed and basically adapt the design to, to fit in between the actual parts. So yeah, so some sensors to actually measure during printing and then adapt what's next in the printing process. And then the integration of all these things is what uh, we call uh, detailing, which is uh, really a design and build system that connects these constraints of the machine uh, and also the evaluation steps. And then, um, yeah, so it's not only uh, the detailing that happens uh, in the studio before and then uh, it's going to be built, but also during production. So it's an uh, adaptive detailing. And yeah, so these are some of the of the joints I printed 
uh, that actually don't follow a specific uh, typology or like or changing a bit. I started calling them in different ways to actually uh, yeah relate them to to the way they work. Like uh, yeah, like these uh, trusses or trees or or things that are just much more organic, but like the joints that we used to see. Uh, and then the outlook of this research goes in the direction of um, using these methods to uh, design structures that do not necessarily are, of course, a standard. Um, and especially I see the, the possibility of using this type of uh, connections as a kind of universal connector to connect any kind of elements, um, uh, especially uh, Today we see the potential of reusing elements. So basically having very diverse type of things and this type of technique that is in a, very, in a way universally uh, adaptable instead of universal, universally a standard. So to connect any kind of thing, uh, yeah, if it's made of metal, but the concepts I think apply to all things as well. Yeah, so with this, I, uh, yeah, finish. Thank you so much, Ines, for a great presentation. Um, yeah, since we will not be taking questions until the end, we will just go forward and uh, we have two more. The next one is Agostino Nicol. And Agostino is a designer and a doctoral candidate uh, at the chair of Digital Architectonics at ITA. And before being awarded the ITA Fellowship in 2021, he also worked at Arab Digital Studio in London on uh, interdisciplinary design innovation team, and also thought architectural design, uh, landscape, landscape design, and video game urbanism theory at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, and Oxford School of Architecture. So Agostino graduated from the Bartlett School of Architecture under Laura Allen and Mark Smout in Unit 11, where his work was awarded the Sir Bannister Fletcher Medal, the Bartlett School of Architecture Medal, and the St. Gobain Innovation Prize. So, Agostino, the floor is yours. Please start. There is no sound. You're on mute. One second. No, you should hear me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, Nicola. Um, my name is Agustino Nickel, and I'm an ITA doctoral fellow, as what's already said, at the Chair of Digital Architectonics and supervised by Professor Ludger Hovestadt. And I'm very excited to be here today. Um, in my PhD, I explore the convergence of digitally augmented and physically manifested bodies, spaces and experiences. My journey of exploring the relationship of digital and spatial phenomena started about two decades ago when I got my first 3D video game to run on my PC, um, before then receiving some more formal architectural education um, in, during academia. In my master's at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, I explored the possibility of using the Sims as an architectural testbed and the partly physical, partly digital, digital nature of both physicalized Pokemons and photogrammetically digitized urban fabric. After my graduation, I explored new pastures of spatial practice, working for several years as an experienced designer at Arab's Digital Studio and teaching design and theory courses at UCL and OSA. Last year, I was given the amazing opportunity to come here to Zurich and to focus on academic research, for which I'm very grateful for. As I'm still at the very beginning of this leg of this journey, um, I won't be able to share with you where I will eventually land, but I'm very excited to tell you where I want to go, why, and how. With ever more realistic graphics, ever faster mobile networks, ever closer hardware in relation to us, as users and other objects of concern, ever slicker interfaces, experiences and services, and ever stronger classification and prediction algorithms, physical and digital realms seem to converge, affecting each other and us in a myriad of ways. And this condition is not exactly new and was called by many different names. Some of them 
make a career as buzzwords being picked up by technology writers, investors, and CEOs. And some of them include spatial computing, ambient computing, the AR cloud, the mirror world, the magic verse, and the metaverse. The key instruments through which we can experience this condition are often cited as virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, or all of the above XR, whilst artificial intelligence is seen as its invisible backbone. One of the latest and most prominent iterations of this naming game was undertaken by Mark Zuckerberg, rebranding his company to Meta and pronouncing the Metaverse. In his announcement, he shows a spectrum from fully fledged virtual environments transversed by embodied avatars to augmented environments brought into existence for work or leisure. Meanwhile, the actual world is accurately mapped and synced to a digital twin. Since the presentation, the metaverse was both hyped as the next version of the internet and scorned as a fad or marketing stunt by critics. This requires careful navigation through layers of hype and corporate storytelling. One thing that can be confidently said is that if the metaverse had a color, it would be dark purple, a gloomy haze resulting from a mix of neon light and gloomy darkness. This comes as no surprise really, because the term the first time appears in the 1992 cyberpunk novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Once we look beyond the purple curtain of cyberpunk heritage, we are confronted with quite a suggestive term, which can serve as a useful entry point to discuss a condition in which virtual holograms in XR glasses start to take place in the world. So my research aims at shining a new light on the following areas. First, the discussions around the metaverse are dominated by commercial narratives and caught in a feedback loop since the late, uh, from the late 20th century until today. And this, I think, makes us quite vulnerable for missing the bigger picture of what's going on here. Here, I'm interested to index which theoretical concepts across a wide history of thought resonate with the idea of the metaverse. Secondly, XR allows us to unleash the power of computer graphics, which was previously contained in two dimensions, into the Euclidean three-dimensional space shared with our perceiving bodies. At the same time, AI, the driving force of sweeping digital disruptions across all sorts of fields in recent years, continues to operate in n-dimensional spaces to which we are completely blind. This paradoxical interplay invites us to rethink how we see and get to know the world and how the world might see and gets to know itself. Thirdly, as architects, we are able to join diverse elements and resolve ambiguities elegantly to form space. But as holograms start to visibly take place, we need to rethink how our profession conceptualizes and designs with and around augmented objects and personas. To approach these questions, it soon became clear that I had to go a bit meta myself to get vantage points beyond the raging discussions of today and the purple cyberpunkian discussions, uh, sorry, atmosphere uh, unfolding below. And here, machine learning techniques such as self-organizing maps can help as jetpacks to propel us up high enough to index the vastness of the contemporary debate. As a start, I looked for the main motifs within three years worth of Twitter data on the metaverse. Based on imminences uh, in each tweet, almost 300,000 instances have sorted themselves into blurry constellations. And through the most common keywords, we see motifs emerging. First, we notice a big cluster around hope, hype, and new investments. Then there is a motif of the treasure or the hunt, the egg hunt in virtual game worlds. Another interesting motif revolves around questions of identity, the avatar or the character um, versus the joker or thief who tries to negate it. Soon we see a prominent group of motifs emerging around the virtual, the true, and the augmented world. And there are many more but um, these already provide me with a great starting point to go into a deeper investigation of the metaverse. Theoretical approaches dealing with augmented matter are not new and can be found in new materialism and media theory and architectural theory and mathematics and natural philosophy. And they spend hundreds or even thousands of years. But how to deal with this huge canon of digitally available knowledge? First, we can look for resonances with our motifs within this corpus which can then become a fertile soil to cultivate a new generative and generally metaversion method. Rather attempting an exhaustive analysis, I want to bring segments of this to life. 
personified figures that possess a body of knowledge otherwise inaccessible to the protagonist and that guide them through hardly graspable worlds is a common topos in mythology and throughout literary history. For example, Virgil and Beatrix in Dante's Divine Comedy who lead the poet through heaven and hell. However, they are also prominently found in cyberpunk literature and films, for example, Anorak in Ready Player One, the Oracle um, in The Matrix, and in video games as non-player characters for introducing or ending quests. Um, and both of the latter really are metaversion motifs. By using a combination of machine learning techniques and my very human abilities of imagination and pattern recognition, I plan to make a rich canon of thought, accessible and relatable, and helping it to crystallize into a set of synthetic guides. A locally enacted uh, metaversal quest can then unfold between me as player, researcher, or architect, and these NPCs, where I can address my research questions. The following is a glimpse into what a metaversion voice might say about the keywords of the last motif that we spoke about. Tiresias, the blind seer, appears and seems to have something to say. He is still a prototype and was fed by Ask Alice on Plato, Plutarch, Seneca, Cicero, Alhazen, Aquinas, Scotus, Rousseau, Dedekind, and a good portion of Deleuze. As we step closer, he senses our presence and speaks. The truth of this I will endeavor to prove. Come hither and let me ask a question of you. What can augment the complete? He doesn't really wait for us to answer. I think that's more a rhetorical thing. Nothing, unless that which is augmented was not perfect. But nothing is harder to find than something which is in all respects a perfect specimen because purely actual objects do not exist. The actual that is perceptible to sight is not perceived by it as it actually exists because it does not resemble the virtuality that it embodies. Every actual surrounds itself within a cloud of virtual images, which must be defined as strictly part of the real object. The reality of the virtual consists of the differential elements, and of these, we only have this dreamlike sense. Therefore, we are blind half our time, and to augment something, we must add something else. The somethingness of this thinkable reality is composed as follows. One is bare, the other clothed. One is repetition of parts, the other of the whole. One involves succession, the other coexistence. One is actual, the other virtual. Both are real as all rational and irrational numbers or the irrational or the rational faculties of the soul. Equipped with this wisdom, we are left to descend from this metaverse back to our universe, to our corporeal condition, surrounded by our familiar things and objects, our cup and our desk. Or are we? I will now risk a first hypothesis. If we take Teresa seriously, reality might have already been augmented long before AI and XR. No, actually it must be augmented with virtuality because otherwise it would simply be actuality. In this sense, the metaverse is not really new. It is already here, even if we can't see it. But what really is new is the momentum to launch devices and protocols that can ubiquitously sense and virtualize parts of actuality and actualize parts of real virtuality in turn. Once we encode an object into an n-dimensional space in which its features find a resonance, it becomes part of virtuality, connected to every element in its difference. As soon as we decode it, rendering it into a three-dimensional hologram, it is not simply an object. It is a meta-object, connected to every other element in its virtual series. But so is each cup, table, or chair, which, as a carrier for the hologram, is optically registered, semantically classified, and uploaded. All of these, including our body, become a matter object connected in their cupness or tableness or bodiness to every other cup, table, or body. The currently often summoned overlay of the digital with the physical realm is not untrue, but it's also misleading, I think, because it suggests that the two realms neatly map on top of each other, even if they can't, being as incommensurable as irrational or rational numbers. This means that what we render can only be slivers or cuts through this virtual plane. We will, so the question is, will we create a metaverse solely for pragmatic applications and seamless experiences? Or will we use this new technology in a way that celebrates reality as plates of divergence, weirdness, and magic? So finally, I want to argue that what slice of virtuality we actualize and the way how we do it really matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agostino. Great presentation. Um, we have our, our last presenter for today.
is Daniela Mitterberger, and she is an architect and researcher with a strong interest in new media, the relationship between human body within digital fabrication and emerging technologies. Currently, she is a PhD researcher and PhD fellow at ETH Zurich at Gramatio Kohler Research, and she focuses on intuition in digital design and robotic fabrication. She is co-founder and director of MADE, a Vienna-based multidisciplinary architecture practice, and previously she was a lecturer at several international graduate and postgraduate programs at the University of Melbourne, ETH Zurich, the Leopold Francis University, Innsbruck, and the Academy of Fine Arts, Vienna. Her work has been recognized with several awards and has been widely exhibited at various international galleries, institutions, and events, including Venice Biennale 2021, Ars Electronica Linz, Melbourne Triennale, uh, Academy of Fine Arts, Vienna, and HDA Graz. So, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, let me just share my screen. Perfect. Great, uh, so thanks for the, the invite and thanks for giving a chance to talk a bit about my research. So my research topic is on human-machine collaboration in computational design and robotic uh, fabrication. And I'm actually in my final year, I'm doing it at uh, Camazio Cola Research. And um, the vision that started my PhD topic or the main question was, um, Human-machine collaboration is very advanced in a lot of different fields. Um, if you look, for instance, at medical robotics, um, we are way further ahead the, uh, in the realm of understanding what robotics can do than we are in uh, architecture or a robotic fabrication. And um, the idea that started uh, my PhD was how can we uh, not just create an automatic machine, but actually a machine that is, has the capability to become a skilled assistant to us. And um, this follows the question of, um, and my research statement, which is, um, my research proposes to investigate and establish novel human-machine collaborations in architecture to define the role of human and human decision-making in digital design and robotic fabrication. And this question of uh, what is the role of the human and the human decision-making in digital design and robotic fabrication is actually a quite complex one and not that easy to answer. And um, I started off with a, with a key diagram which investigates the relation that we have um, decision make, but also physical presence in the fabrication realm and also in the design realm um, with uh, robotic and digital fabrication. Here are some of the tools uh, and sensors that we already have uh, available as architects um, that can actually help us to, uh, to sense, so use the human body and the human as a sensor device and also to actuate. And the same thing happens with machines and robots what can a robot, uh, robot sense and what can a robot actuate? And um, this question was uh, I answered within my PhD, investigating different methods of sensing and actuation. And by uh, developing uh, different protocols, um, actually investigating what that means for the human role in uh, architectural fabrication. And uh, I investigated it in uh, four main key projects. Um, the left to uh, the first one was augmented bricklaying, um, which led to a human machine collaborative process, uh, process on the bottom. And then um, IROP interactive robotic plastering, and uh, the last one on the right bottom, which is um, teleoperated construction site. And um, I want to show you the two or give a quick introduction to two of the key projects that I was doing on the left one augmented bricklaying and on the right one interactive robotic plastering because they were investigating two of the main questions. The augmented bricklaying investigated the um, augmented human and interactive robotic plastering investigated the uh, augmented machine, augmented robot. So to start to tackle the topic from two different directions. Um, augmented bricklaying was a building project in Greece. We finished it in 2019, and it was back then, and as far as I'm uh, informed, is still the biggest augmented uh, project uh, uh, done with augmented reality worldwide. 
Um, it started with um, uh, the client was coming to come out to us, to come out to Polar Research, asking actually to make another building like the Gantenbein Winery and then um, asking uh, if it uh, would make sense to make a, a, another iteration of robotic fabrication at Brick Lane. And um, 2019, we actually asked, okay, what is new in the field? What can we do? And it was exactly when I started my PhD asking the question of human machine collaboration. And we said, okay, uh, why we don't look for different methods and different tools that we could use to build uh, a, a similar complex brick wall with actually more freedom, uh, aesthetical freedom and fabrication freedom. So there are different ways how we can make such complex brick walls. The first one is, of course, with uh, manual fabrication that means physical templates and guiding systems, which is very complex and very expensive. The second one is robotic fabrication, um, which was the Gantenbein winery on the left, uh, has uh, its advantages, but it has also its disadvantages. Advantages are, for instance, that you can manufacture directly from 3D. But limitations, of course, are still on-site usage. And uh, for instance, usage, usage of materials such as mortar, which is very difficult to compute with robotic fabrication. And the third one, which uh, allows us to build as complex uh, brick walls is for instance, augmented fabrication, which combines the advantages of manual assembly, for instance, the dexter human dexterity with robotic assembly, uh, geometric precision. Here you can see the final result. We collaborated with Incon AI, which uh, um, developed uh, novel augmented reality interfaces and software. Um, and what you can see here is the final facade where you can see we were working with a different rotation, creating these patterns, facade patterns that change over time and um, have this uh, resemblance of uh, light in water. So this is uh, the place that they actually used to store uh, the wine, so the liquid. And the main question was we had to inform the how to tell the brick layer how to move a brick in space uh, to find the right location to create these patterns. And this is a actually quite difficult question um, because it involves uh, rotations in multiple uh, directions and it involves that it needs to have a constant tracking of the brick in space. Um, the second big question that we had was, um, how to tell it a bricklay in a very intuitive way. So what, is an interf what does an interface need to do um, to inform any bricklayer? So these were Greek bricklayers um, fast in how to uh, rotate a brick. And as you can see here, bricklayers actually, when they rotate bricks or adjust bricks in space, they hit them with a, a trowel or a hammer and they don't actually rotate it like a gun like we are used to. And I was taking this as a first uh, input uh, and using that directly in the, in the interface to create a fast and intuitive way and also to use elements of gamifications. That means elements that add uh, fun to uh, the process of bricklaying. And um, as you can see here, what, you, uh, what the bricklayer was seeing was um, it was tracking the current location of the brick. So you can see that the, uh, the software that we are using tracked the edges of the brick. So it was detecting the current location of the brick um, in space. It knew where the brick should go. And by uh, knowing these two things, um, we were calculating on how to adjust the brick um, to actually reach its final destination. Um, and I uh, was doing that by showing arrows that showed where the brick layer had to hammer on the brick to place the brick in the final position. And the length of the arrow showed um, also the, um, the strength of the hit that should come. And by doing so, it was very fast and simple to adjust the brick in space without uh, needing to understand a lot um, of geometrical complexities that are behind all of that. Also the bricklayers were seeing how much more that they had to place because um, one thing we couldn't do beforehand was actually having a lot of mortar in the design and uh, therefore, uh, we thought it was, would be very beautiful to have the mortar as a very important design element as part of the facade. So each mortar was a uh, mortar amount for each part of the brick was different and the brick layer was starting to learn it by the, reading the different symbols. Um, so at the uh, end, we had to, of course, build the whole winery in Greece. So we were sending, that, that was what we were sending to 
to Greece. Uh, instead of producing everything robotically, we were sending uh, the software plus the, the tracking systems. And um, uh, so we had two different computers, one for visualization, one for calculation and a camera and an IMU used to detect the position and tracking the position of the brick in space. Um, at the end, we actually used, a, a, this is the, the a picture of the system that we were sending down with um, um, the design, of course, um, being adaptable on site, which was also very important. Um, the next very important part was actually how to make augmented reality work for uh, construction site. Everyone who ever used augmented reality knows it's terrible if it's sunny and uh, it's not um, very comfortable to wear it for a long time. That's why we decided for screen-based augmented reality. And this was also a big part to make it work for the construction site in Greece in summer. So we had a lot of odds against us, um, but we found uh, custom solutions um, for uh, building the winery on site. And here you can see at the end, we had two different uh, bricklayer groups starting to build the system. Uh, we split it in an operator and a bricklayer. The reason for that was because it was a fair face, double fair face brick wall. And um, we had a lot of different actions that the bricklayer had to do. Um, very trained bricklayers that worked on with the system for a long time actually were able to do it by themselves. But especially at the beginning, we split it in two human users that were working on the system. Here you can see um, I see that the videos don't go very well. Um, then I will just maybe just skip to the part where you can see that people use the system. So here you can see we have one human operator and one bricklayer. Um, here you can see the errors. Um, here the amount of mortar that it replaced for each brick. So it was very abundant. Uh, something that if you work with robotic processes is a nightmare, but especially with these new technologies allow you to use um, material that is not easy to predict and that needs human uh, dexterity and intuition to work with. And also of course expertise. Here you can see the arrows and where the brick layer starts to adjust the brick. And once the brick is in the right location, the errors disappear and the brick layer can move on to the next brick. Here you can see that um, uh, another big advantage of this system was, of course, everything was algorithmically designed. So we could update what you were seeing on the augmented reality system in real time. So we could adjust the design um, on site when we were seeing, for instance, that the rotation was not enough we were able to adjust this and react uh, immediately to uh, the building. Here you can see some of the, the facade details where you can really see the difference of the mortar height that create this three-dimensional effect, even though the facade was, in, uh, was plain. Here you can also see, so it looks very three-dimensional, even though all the, the center points of the grips, uh, bricks are uh, placed on top of each other. The second uh, project that I want to show you is IROP, which is Interactive Robotic Plastering. Um, it's a, a project that um, discusses how we can include the human back into the robotic fabrication process and what are the, the advantages of a human user in this fabrication process. And as you can see here, we had a, a plastering, a spraying setup, and we combined it with uh, um, an augmented, projected augmented reality system that was tracking the hand gestures of a user. Um, it were, there were three key components of this research. The first one is uh, the stylistic filter selection, which is um, a different way of designing. So instead of um, producing the design and then sending it to the robot and then looking at the final outcome, uh, it was based on the idea that there are stylistic filters that you can apply to human input and by that manipulating the robotic output. So you were translating human input into um, robotic uh, uh, constraints and design constraints. The second big part was the interactive design mode, which had a projected augmented reality system that projected directly in one-to-one -one scale on the construction site 
the, um, the outcome of the input that the human user is giving. And uh, of course, a tracking uh, system. And then the third big part was the robotic plaster spraying, which included a, a plaster spraying setup for on site robotic plastering. And the steps were uh, the following the first one was the selection of a filter. So the user could select a filter that they liked. So any kind of stylistic filters, it could be a one-to-one a -one translation of the human input. So you draw a line, it draws a line, or for instance, it can be a stylistic one where you say you draw a line, but instead of following the line, you can give circles or patterns as an input. Uh, this allows different styles um, to be applied on the construction set and to be tested on the construction set. Um, the second big part was localization as we tested everything in one uh, on the construction set in a three week period, we were moving the whole setup and spraying uh, the whole interior of the space. And the third part was designing. So the user were dis uh, uh, designing it on site and adjusting the design on site and previewing the potential outcome on site. Um, and the last part was the robotic spraying. And then the user could decide if they want to continue or um, end uh, the fabrication design mode. Here you can see what one, one of the biggest parts was actually the remapping of the human input in robotic output, in robotic toolpaths. Um, this included um, some of the input where, for instance, the, the distance of the hand uh, to a target surface, the velocity of the hand gesture of the human user, um, then of course the individual positions that the user could um, store. And this was then interpolated and remapped um, to uh, specific target planes of the uh, robotic toolpaths, uh, end effector distance of the robot, uh, robot velocity, um, angle of the, uh, of, of the robot. Uh, and um, this remapping was um, different and dependent on the different stylistic filters that the user were picking. So this is an example. Um, the closer the hand was to the target surface, for instance, um, was this was translated in some of the filters into a smaller end effector distance. And this created a rippling effect because the nozzle of the spraying nozzle was closer to the liquid uh, deposited material. So um, once the user started to uh, understand uh, the system, um, they were actually using that as a stylistic method in applying it directly on site where they wanted uh, specific rippling effects and where they wanted to have a smooth uh, surface. And here you can see some of the examples of these uh, stylistic filters. The first one, for instance, is a hand drawing filter. That was um, These filters were developed within the realm of a MIS design studio, um, where we set up the computational setup. And then within this computational setup, users can define their own uh, filters. And the first one is a hand drawing filter. So it's a one-to-one -one translation of the human input into robotic output. The second one is a pattern filter that is a more abstract translation of human input into robotic output. Then we had the tweening filter, which added some additional computational complexity to the human input and a sculpting filter, which was working more uh, mesh related, so more surface related. And then an agent-based filter where the human input was very minimal, but had a very big effect. So for instance, for very big surfaces, uh, you don't want to draw everything by hand, but you want to just give a directionality. And um, this was a great filter to do so. Here you can see a picture of what the user actually saw while drawing on site. This was twinning filter. Um, the user saw which step they were in. So there were different modes where they could operate and adjust their designs. Um, number two is the, some robotic fabrication parameters like the robot reach at the specific locations. So the user could actually use this information to adjust the design. And number three is the, the dots, the different color dots show the distance of the hand to the target surface, which was according to the different filters then used in different ways. And four was um, depicting with the numbers the di uh, different amount of layers that were sprayed. So it had a, an influence on the thickness of the wall in that specific location. And here you can see the setup that we were using to spray in a three week continuously. Um, on the back, you can see the robotic uh, spraying setup. And on the front, you see the user continually designing on site the next um, 
plaster elements. And the very interesting moment was actually at the end where um, we started to see the very complex designs, these micro gestures that were a very difficult, very hard to compute uh, in just sitting in front of Rhino or just sitting in front of a competition setup. But it was very, very intuitive when using the hand as an input uh, device. Uh, here you can see a video um, of uh, the final result of the cluster spraying setup. So we brought uh, a robot with an actually on a vertical tower. So we were able to have a bigger reach. Um, we used uh, augmented projection mapping because it allowed us to directly project on the construction site. Uh, it was very simple to use and very easy to use. Um, the precision that we had of the tracking was under five millimeters. And this allowed us to be quite accurate in the tracking of the user input. And here you can see the user drawing, so the distance which was uh, tracked in real time and previewed in real time. And here the user, for instance, adjusts um, the outcome the, of the robotic toolpaths. Here you can see this also allowed uh, the users to discuss directly on site on what. Uh, what should be sprayed. Here you can see the robotic spraying uh, setup. The very interesting part of the robotic spraying setup was also that we used an inter real sense to track what was sprayed in uh, real time. So we can also um, inform the user uh, on the precision of the sprayed result in relation to the, to the input. You can see the, the vertical uh, axis in action. And very interesting part of this research was we conducted a user study at the end, which uh, allowed us to investigate what it would mean for an architect or a designer um, to overlay the design and the fabrication process uh, and not separate these two uh, actions anymore. Um, we also uh, did a user study with plasterers and asked them uh, what they think about the system. And it was very interesting how, uh, how open um, plasterers were, for instance, and actually uh, what were their input um, to the system. So yeah, uh, if you have any further questions or any, uh, if you want to contact me, uh, please don't hesitate. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, well, this would conclude our presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. I just want to add that uh, five of our presenters uh, today are actually ETA fellows, and they have received the fellowship in the last three to four years. And we hope that uh, this has inspired you to apply to our program and end up achieving something as interesting as and as exciting as our fellows have. And earlier in this video, you will find the link where you can learn more about our fellowship and actually how to apply. Now, I believe uh, we'll go back to Neil, who, uh, who will uh, yeah, facilitate the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Nikola. And thank you for the presentations. Really fascinating range of topics and uh, um, very thought provoking. Um, uh, I, I've got a, uh, there's a comment actually in the chat, which is very um, close to some of the things I was thinking about uh, uh, this last presentation by Daniela, which is um, intriguing in many ways. Um, uh, the question in the, in the chat is, why was the brick, uh, brickwork not done fully robot with robotics? And, but there's a, a, there's somehow there's, a, there's, a, there's another sort of bigger, deeper question that's, that's there as well, which is when I was, when Inez was, was presenting her work, there was a kind of a comment almost, almost the opposite. Like we could, we could, we don't necessarily need the work person anymore. And we can almost like uh, go straight from the, the digital model to the fabrication kind of thing, which of course actually has a huge implication in terms of the, con the construction process itself and, and opens up the possibility of a new way of operating similar in many ways to, to the way that uh, I think someone like Philip Young is, who's here with us today. Um, 
uh, has, in, in setting up a factory where the architect is really in control of the whole process. Um, and so I guess the question really for Daniela, which is, you know, it is a kind of provocation, especially in the context of Gramazio Kola's initial research, which is completely robotic. Uh, and I think it's almost like, you know, when you're kind of almost learning from the, the, the bricklayer, um, is the eventual intention to actually d to digitize the whole process uh, as the next step in this thing? Or because the, the intervention of, of, of bringing in the bricklayer into that process is, is intriguing. And also, not just the bricklayer, but also the, uh, the plasterer. Um, so I just wanted to kind of raise that question of what is the, what is the end game of this? And um, because it's hugely provocative in, in terms of uh, the kind of the potential future of, of, of construction and the role of the architect and so on. Thanks, Neil, for the for the question. Um, well, personally, I, I personally believe that um, there are huge advantages to create systems that allow the human to still stay in the loop. Um, I'm not saying that all systems should be like this. I think there are very there are great processes that work fully automated. But I think especially when it comes to complex material systems that are hard to simulate or that are hard to predict, uh, we still need uh, the human in the loop because we just don't have the, te the technology yet that allows us to be as fast as we are. So one might say even it, it might help us to go towards automation, might say that uh, it helps us to bridge gaps till we are at the moment of somewhere, but also I think we, we see new potential that we would have not seen by just aiming uh, towards full automation without seeing that we could include other, other processes. Um, and I think especially the, you know, including um, bricklayers or plasterers in such processes is extremely valuable. Um, knowledge that they had, me as an architect, I just had never had a, didn't come to my mind. And it simply started because uh, we are used to 3D modeling, 3D spaces, and they are not used to that. And they're used to use their, their body and their hands and tools to produce. And I think this is uh, uh, extreme knowledge that we have that we can access. And if by translating that into digital processes, we create something completely new and something very interesting. And I think especially when it comes to interfaces, this is an, was a field in architecture is first that is not talked that much about yet. But it's very interesting because it's really this in intersection where the human starts to deal or inter, inter, intersect work, and work with software and robots and very much influences how, how, we, how we work with them and how they are also accepted in work processes. Um, regarding the question, why, why not robots for the brick wall? It was very simple. So the, the first, it was in Greece. So we were discussing, do we need to pre-produce everything in Switzerland and ship bricks? from Switzerland to Greece, or is there a different way that we can do it? And the second uh, point was, we were using handmade bricks and a lot of mortar. This is simply, uh, it's very difficult robotically because anything that it's not standardized, anything that is changing according to complex variables like mortar changes according to the temperature, humidity, uh, the person who mixes it, it's very difficult to produce anything like this and then not standard. Um, so it was almost the only way to do it uh, with uh, the kind of current standard that we have. And it was, of course, a challenge, but I think it was something where I said, okay, we could test the first time something like this in big scale and on the construction side, which is, again, outside the lab, uh, things start to become uh, very tricky, but also very interesting. Yeah, thank, yeah. I, I noticed you would use the word still. We, we still need to use this, and I'm just wondering what the future might hold. I don't know whether Inez wants to contribute to that, because I think in some ways your Inez's uh, contribution was a slightly different take on things. Inez, you want to comment? Yeah, I think, uh, so I think, of course, I agree with uh, having the human in the loop. I What I focus on or trying to understand is like how actually machine, like working with machines help us in a way to understand more what we're doing. Like in a way, when we give instructions, implicit, implicit instructions to someone else to do it, we kind of um, delay 
delay a lot of uh, knowledge or or understand or or give it to to another part, which is of course fantastic because then we we expand and use the experts. But um, but I think uh, I don't know the role of an architect being very knowledgeable in every single part for me it's, it's as, I mean as a as a curious person or learning person it's fantastic that's why I, I focus on detailing because there you can't skip really understanding how it works and uh, yeah I, I see it as an opportunity I'm, I'm I really don't see kind of uh, this thing of like uh, or robots or uh, I don't know kind of uh, augmented reality I think it depends so much on what the, the task is what is the goal and what's the problem how much uh, yeah, how much automation can the, the system afford as exactly as uh, I think uh, automating um, placement of mortar is super difficult and there's no, no, no sense. But for example, I don't know, like metal also is super uh, uh, hard to predict or we are, we are in the same situation. We are trying to, to control this material, but actually it's actually much more difficult than it seems because there's also a heat development during the printing process that changes everything. And actually what we get is not exactly what we were expecting. And we are in the beginning of actually being able to model these things. So, so there is actually a bit of the same concept of using uh, sensors or being able to measure, being able to actually have a system that can get data during the process. So not fully uh, designing everything. So I think it, in, in that respect, it, I don't see it so different. Uh, uh, like using a robot, just instructing the robot to do it or, 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 or having, uh, yeah, someone to do it, but more or less what's the system behind that allows to, to, to output geometry as needed during the construction process. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know whether, whether Philip would like to contribute to this, because Philip, of course, you probably know is uh, he's with us, but he's been using robotic fabrication technologies to stack bricks in the past. I guess the bigger kind of, I wouldn't say, oh, it's a big economic question, is how does the architect who is increasingly marginalized within the construction process, I mean, the example I always refer to is, you know, the, the, the notion of the Al, from Alberti, of the architect being in charge and the, the work person being a tool in the hand of the architect, increasingly with new contracts, uh, especially with developers as, as the client, the architect works for the developer. So therefore, the, the architect's a tool in the hand of the developer. And it seems to me that there is this potential for the architect to take charge of the whole process in a way that I think Philip is doing with his own research in terms of kind of like uh, thinking of, of a direct process of design to fabrication and doing prefabricating and, and, and controlling the whole process. But I don't know if Philip, you would like to uh, contribute to the discussion because your work is, I think, very relevant here. Okay, thank you, and um, um, thanks a lot to Nicola to organize this special um, um, lecture sequence from uh, ETH. I think uh, it's a uh, it's great presentations from from you guys, uh, and uh, great thanks to your uh, sharing uh, your research to the whole world, including in in China. Uh, Bilibili tonight we have uh, uh, more than one thousand audience here and. In your lectures, I think that will be a, a great uh, event, and especially we have a lecture sequence in Tongji in my university, and the more than three hundred uh, students here. I think uh, that's also great. Appreciate for the the sharing culture here. We're trying to 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 build up, um, because uh, I'm very very familiar with um, uh, the research of ETH because. Um, as a relevant research, uh, we uh, also set up a research center here over the past 10 years and uh, a lot of um, very relevant research um, here. So the first question I think is really interesting. Uh, uh, Daniela and uh, the last presenter actually you put forward the question of um, the loop, uh, the human and machine collaboration. So uh, I think it's uh, really important to rethinking on our uh, research uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, we create a lot of uh, control and uh, accurate, precise control in the loop of design and construction. Actually, everything is in the modeling and actually the, um, the, the censoring and feedback from and the process actually is still in control. Um, um, where uh, compared to the human uh, design and construction process, it's interesting um, the worker or the uh, on-site uh, institute work sometimes will have some mistake. So the creative process from the 
con contractor or the constructor workers can make some mistake. That would be interesting to produce certain kinds of beauty. You mean? I mean, so I think your research, you uh, actually use uh, this kind of uh, AR uh, um, uh, augmented uh, construction, replace robotic construction, which is in situ um, construct the, the, the beautiful modeling uh, bricks. So the question goes to, is there any um, primitive beauty to think uh, the machine and the human, and the machine and the human collaborative process. Do you think it still should follow the model we modeling the computer, or do you think this kind of process can produce of unpredictable process beauty uh, in this loop? So I think uh, that uh, will uh, uh, will be very important to to evaluate if we should use robotics and how we collaborate with machine. So that's the first question. Thank you very much for the question, Philip. Um, I absolutely believe that there is a beauty in the design that we otherwise don't have access to when we include the human. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. So it's not completely let's give up on a digital model. I think it's kind of designing or working with new digital models that allow a freedom of, for instance, material freedom or freedom of expression within the computational model and clever user interfaces and precise tracking systems allow you to do this. So you can still be sure that, for instance, the wall stands, but you still allow a personalized fabrication. And I think this aesthetics is something that is very new. So we went from something very handcrafted to something robotic fabrication. Now we are at the kind of the moment of time where we kind of can redefine this aesthetics, what it could mean. So we can personalize it. You can see the handcrafted uh, gesture within the robotically fabricated. And this has uh, the value of that has to be investigated. And uh, because now we, we, we have the devices that can, that can help us produce it. And I think that's why I was so interested in how the importance of how you remap or uh, translate input. So how much freedom do you give the user and how much is it then still computationally, aesthetically, what you wanna do? And it's also an interesting discussion point for the architect, like how much freedom do we give other people to start to work with our designs? And I think this is a very crucial moment where you say, okay, how much of control of it as an architect are you willing to give up? And most architects that work with the construction side or build a lot, they know that there is a lot of decisions happening on site. There's a lot of things happening things that you cannot draw, for instance, that are a hedge on the plan, but you let the, the crafts people do it. And I think the moment you actually speak that out loud and say, even in the computational setup, we need to create an empty space of creative articulation um, and still be precise. I think that's something very, very interesting. And there's a lot, yeah. of, a lot of space where we can still go and develop. And I think it's interesting times. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's really interesting for your two um, projects. I think um, uh, a lot of potential um, possibilities. I think, um, but especially um, the the great impression to me is uh, I'm I'm I I try to find some uh, interesting potential. Maybe not everything control, just like the modeling process. Uh, for for example, the plaster uh, project uh, because you actually can have a simultaneous um, control through the sensor of the robotics arm. And at the same time, um, is that kind of a beauty of primitive? Because I, I remember last year, I, I was invited to in the, in the final review uh, for UCL. The, uh, I remember a team, they just pile concrete on the construction site and, and then uh, take um, each component and put them on the facade. So every component is extremely difficult, uh, different because the, uh, the mode, the form of the, the sand actually could be redefined naturally by the materiality. Uh, so uh, when we collaborate with modeling and, uh, and I think the machines, uh, it's really important to think about the, the primitive, I think um, the raw roughness and the unpredictable that's kind of beauty because right now in neural MoMA, uh, I have a project uh, uh, in, the uh, in, uh, in the exhibition that was uh, around five years ago. Actually, I, uh, I manipulate uh, the, the recycle bricks 
and use robotics institute constructed. I think the, the beauty is not from modern, but actually the roughness of this recollect uh, the, the, uh, uh, bricks because it's not very precise. It's different size uh, one by one, but actually the beauty from this kind of uh, randomness. Uh, so it's really uh, have a potential uh, thinking on your research. It's really meaningful. I think you can put forward a new solution, a new detour lines to to searching for the this kind of collaborative uh, machine and human, human collaborative construction process. Another question goes to I think um, Iona, uh, your research because my team uh, I have two PhD students doing very similar research with you. Uh, one of them is research on the concrete, uh, another one is plastic. And you, you see uh, in Akadeli uh, in 2020, my team print a 2,000 square meters canopy uh, just using the similar uh, methodology, you, 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 uh, uh, similar to your design. But I think um, the question goes to you, I think it's really meaningful to be thinking on the, the printing two paths uh, and uh, how to print not the, the parallel the, uh, contour lines, but uh, which have a very strong rele relevant to the geometry. Uh, the question goes to the skill. I think the skill really matters because the geometry is not the, the structure. If you enlarge the skill, the geometry will have a very strong uh, relation to the structure system. I think um, uh, in, in, in Philip Block's project, we can see some uh, feedback. And uh, your, your professor, uh, Dillenberg, also a good friend of me, I think um, uh, uh, it's, it's important because it's a long-term PhD uh, study. I don't know how would you like to address this kind of panels to, in, to a system, because uh, the last slides you're showing, which is a bigger uh, minimal surface you want to print, but actually it should be subdivided into different panels. And uh, this kind of tessellation um, panels, uh, 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 how would you like to, to, to put them together as a, a whole system? I don't know. Uh, hello. Uh, I, first of all, I think I am familiar with the work you mentioned, if it was this branching canopy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yes, I've seen it really interesting and great work. So yeah, of course, for 3D printing, um, scaling up always is the question, because um, it's not just about producing bigger objects, that there is something fundamentally different once we start facing um, larger scale, um, yeah, a larger scale construction. And um, the way that I have been thinking about, of course, this um, final slide that I had was a more like conceptual idea of how I would envision this, and it was not um, entirely, um, realistic, let's say, because of course this would have to be printed into separate parts. But then um, the way that I have been thinking about it and which will be part of my next steps is that, okay, now we have all of these super nice tools for controlling path orientation. And so far these, has been, these have been uh, serving, let's say more of an aesthetic um, role. Um, but um, the idea would be to then, how could the paths be oriented so that they are related to the forces of the object? And you also mentioned uh, the work of Block Research Group where they already have tried uh, going in that direction with the bridge in Venice that was created, uh, that was printed with concrete. And there the curves, the, the paths are curved and they are uh, following the forces direction. So this was, uh, relatively a uh, funicular structure. So finding the force directions was simpler, but for me, the idea would be, okay, what if we take a, what if we use structural analysis and then use this as an input for driving the paths orientation on more complex shapes. Um, so this would be how I envision the patterns being useful um, in scaling up. So the idea would be, uh, let's try to orient the path so that we produce a stronger object. So we take advantage of this inherent anisotropy of the 3D printed objects to create an, a stronger um, result with better mechanical properties. And then also there is the question of the segmentation, which complicates everything, of course. And um, yeah, I don't really have an answer for this yet. So in which way can um, segmentation be also um, serving uh, the scaling up of those geometries? At the moment, the segmentation has been mostly answering to fabrication constraints. So there's so many 
issues that come up during fabrication re regarding the, um, the orientation of paths that you can't just keep printing forever regarding the size, regarding the curvature of pieces and the, the direction of gravity, all of these play a role. Um, so yeah, so far uh, it has been uh, the fabrication constraints that have um, determined the, the segmentation strategies and not yet the scale of the final object, but that is definitely part of the next steps. Okay, I think your research is super uh, important, especially to the uh, 3D printing, robotic 3D printing, uh, uh, especially goes to the mega scale. I think uh, you, uh, the two, two paths is extremely important to be redefined, rethinking uh, goes to this kind of uh, geometry system. So looking forward to see your next uh, step <laughs> goes to the mega Thank scale. you. Thanks a lot. And another question I have three. Uh, then I can go to uh, uh, Ines. I think uh, your research, I like your research a lot because the details produce a kind of unpredictable. Uh, I think that's the most beauty. Uh, it's not to defined totally by the uh, design process. Uh, but I, I try to ask um, uh, the, the formation process. Um, uh, you, you introduced the joints actually from some connections. Do you have any um, a structure and performance based uh, 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 the form generated process? So how uh, would you like to evaluate uh, the optimal um, solution or uh, how efficiency uh, could you produce a, a multi uh, uh, joints, uh, multi uh, details project and put them together? Uh, uh, is there any potential possibility to go to some uh, some mega uh, use of your project? But I like the, the beauty uh, the regular geometry and this kind of unpredictable joints. I think it's you produce a new, uh, 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 new, a new form. I think it's a, a very interesting new form, and showing the rational and irrational uh, can integrate together. So I'm looking forward to see the uh, how to rationalize your, 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 your contribution to this kind of uh, 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 melting joints. Yeah, uh, so I can comment a bit on that. Thank you for the comment. Um, <clears throat> it's a, it's the key comment because, um, the, of course, a connection is uh, it's meant to support. And this is the question I, I struggled with the whole PhD because it's, uh, it's, it's let's say how we think about the, the function is so crucial, right? These joints, it's uh, interesting that they, the everything I, I printed, it's standing by itself. So it's no need in a way to and to 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 test this. It, it, it's working. So it's it's interesting how we need in a way to understand uh, how performative it is. I don't know the answer is I don't know. But especially because we need to do a lot of uh, material understanding first, um, and this is what I, I try to start during the PhD, particularly because a lot of one research is focused on the con continuous printing, and there. Uh, uh, people are much ahead, but uh, we're focusing on this uh, point by point, which is a bit different and it looks super fragile. So we started trying to look at this uh, in more detail. Um, for now, there's no performance evaluation uh, for real. It's a, that's why um, I call it a material distribution tendency. So it looks like the material should be placed around there, but there's no comparison of the volume of the original topology optimization with the volume that we're printing. So there's no there's no actually answer. Uh, there's no correct uh, joint here. Um, however, there are of course the steps that are being taken uh, by my collaborators. They are looking into how to actually do a topology optimization task that is correct. So this is this is basically one of the future steps. Uh, how to uh, do a topology optimization that incorporates the problems of the the size of the members without losing of course the performance or how how uh, stiff is this connection related to the whole structure so it's not only the connection right but it's the whole uh, structural system so so questions add up <laughs> in in a lot of uh, directions uh, it's yeah I, I think we are at the very early early stage but of course this is this is the key component to understand uh, how they work. I think um, the contribution here, at least what I tried, is to conceptualize how function comes in in the whole picture, 
is not uh, because if we start there only and actually we, we will face a lot of problems on fabrication at the end so so i try to position the problem in the middle and of course opening for experts also uh, to to look at this into more detail but yeah very challenging <laughs> yes yes i think maybe that's the way for uh, the future how we can implement the robotics in the artistic uh, creative process in architecture discipline. So that's, that's I, I like your research very much. I think you should keep um, uh, doing some, uh, uh, some big mock-up uh, based on this, this, this very interesting thinking. Thank you. So new, we have a lot of questions from Paul. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to, there are a couple of questions in the chat, which um, maybe you can ask in a second, but I just wanted to quickly ask, uh, Agostino, uh, actually, I've got two questions, but I mean, I think, thank you for your presentation, Agostino, very, very thought provoking. I need to, to go through it again, listen to it again. Um, uh, but there are a couple of thoughts that I, I had. The first one was, um, I guess, when we're dealing with the domain, I mean, I, I take your point that the metaverse is pretty much rebranding what we already had in some sense, but it's the potential where we can use it and develop it further as a concept, which I find interesting. The first question I've got is, I mean, I, 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 I wasn't sure whether you, you, you were engaging with this, but there is a kind of a discourse going on within neuroscience largely um, about how what we we have in our mind is itself a kind of, uh, well, we, we, we never engage with the real world outside. It always comes to us in a certain sort of way um, through predictive perceptions. There's a whole work that's going on in terms of Anil Seth, in terms of how we elucidate our reality. Um, and David Chalmers also wrote a book recently about Reality Plus, where he questions whether we ever engage with reality. And the model seems to be that actually what we take for reality is itself a virtual form of reality. Um, so I'm just wondering, and that was something that Slavoj Žižek put in, um, wrote about many years ago, I, I published an essay of his from, from virtual reality, the virtualization of reality, where he's kind of saying that, that everything comes to us through them, through the filter of the imagination, therefore, what we have in our brain is a kind of virtual world. Is that something that you bring into your um, your, your discussion um, of the metaverse, that the fact that we we have in our brain something that is not necessarily the reality as such, but something else? I, I, this, the other kind of comment I'd say is that Jeff Hawkins was making a comment that uh, in his discussion when we had this series on architecture, uh, AI and neuroscience um, recently in the doctoral consortium, where we said basically in our brain, we have a model of the world, a complete model of the world. Does that kind of begin to, so those kind of those, those kind of neuroscientific sort of uh, 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 ideas, do they filter into your discussion about the metaverse? Thank you, Neil. I think these are great, great questions. And like, I think that's also, it also shows like how valuable it is to present quite early in like the PhD research process because one gets a lot of feedback and, and, and learns a lot. I haven't looked a lot into like the neuroscience aspect of it yet, um, but like, I think it definitely will come up and like, it's like a key because it links to this kind of like idea of like how we perceive um, the world and like what, what virtual and actual actually means. Because like, I think that these are at the core of like what is at stake when we discuss the metaverse. Um, I think this, what you discussed about the, what you just brought up about like the model of the world and like whether it's virtual or actual. Um, I think that this is the key, the key question for the metaverse is it is about the world and it is about like how we conceptualize it. And I think uh, augmented reality, not in its like technical definition um, that we find like, an, uh, uh, like something that is heightened in a specific way. I think that is like what a, a meta version kind of um, space should, should, should be like, a place where like we allow for like another type of appreciation of what's, what's around us and for like the invisibleness of things. And I think this becomes really topical in the moment where we start to augment or like actualize things that like then can be seen through these, uh, these, these glasses because then suddenly we can like we take something out of that invisible realm Put it in front of us and like we kind of like engineered in such a way that like whether i put my glasses on in here in in, in europe and in china and america uh, the thing the hologram will kind of like look look similar it's engineered in, in, in a certain way to do that and like i think um really probing into that question of like what do we want to uh to visualize and like how do we visualize it and how do we visualize it in such a way that like it doesn't make the world um like 
less complex or like less simple or like more kind of like graspable or like do we want to do it in such a way that like actually celebrates the diversity richness uh, complexity that that ha we have around us and that is within us in our kind of like perceptive ability and like i think that also like links to um like something that, that we discussed before with like the the, the work of um uh, my, my colleagues at ETH, this question of like how technology sometimes becomes this invitation to rethink uh, how we think about stuff and ourselves. And there's this um, very beautiful uh, quote by um, Donna Haraway, where she writes about the camera and like how the, the, the camera and the invention of the camera really kind of um, uh, repositions the way that like how we think about vision. And that we should see ourselves as like active preservers, that there is no passive vision and that every vision is like a, reflects a part of life, something along these lines. And like, I think that by approaching these technologies and by taking them seriously, I think, yeah, we can unpeel so much of um, how we, yeah, how we, how we think about, about the world and the model that we have of it. No, I completely agree with that. I was just when you mentioned the, the photography, I, I don't know if you know, but Walter Benjamin um, wrote a lot about photography and he kind of introduced a kind of f uh, f photographic kind of uh, analogies into his way of thinking about how we see the world. I mean, we see the world in terms of the, the snapshot and so on and so on. And I'm wondering precisely what you're doing. I mean, as, as you're saying, you know, whether the world, let's say, of AI might begin to, or indeed the metaverse, might begin to kind of infiltrate the way in which we understand the world itself and whether there are any, any lessons there. I, I always go back to the model of the Craig Reynolds and how he managed to understand the flocking behavior of birds by, by mapping it. And then the, the bird experts found out about birds from, from the, that world. So I think that's kind of super interesting. The other question I had though was, is about the, um, you mentioned just the digital twin. And I, I must say, I, at some level, I'm kind of completely bored about the metaverse. But I do think that the metaverse as a possible digital twin is something that could be incredibly useful. I, um, that already we have the example in, in China, of, I think, of, um, I mentioned this in my book on AI, about how uh, there is a, a they, they, in, in, they use uh, uh, city brain as a way of, of, of sorting out traffic problems and a kind of digital twin, real time uh, feedback from the city itself, which I think is, is obviously going to be the way that that the traffic's going to be dealt with in the future. But there's also other potentials of how we can use a digital twin. I've got one of my doctoral researchers, Wang Yu He, um, at FIU, in the DDES, is, is, is trying to use the metaverse as a way to kind of like, to simulate sort of behavioral operations. So, um, <clears throat> you know, so you might have agents, uh, human agents, you might have the exoskeleton, the fabric of the building itself, and some interaction which is simulated and modeled in, in, on, on some virtual realm that then can become a way of, of of, of generating a design. So the metaverse, or what do we call it, becomes a domain in which we can explore potential designs. Uh, yeah, let me just throw that at you to see what you think. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> um, I think um, I think that this is kind of like also one of the, the, the big promises. And like, I think also something that like, for example, um, we, we also just saw in the last presentation this possibility of the augmented reality space um, as a space to um, to prototype or to play or to act something out that then will later on have repercussions in the in the physical space, but in such a way that like we don't already spray the concrete on the wall. We, we do it first in, 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 on a digital twin, and then we let it spray on the wall because once it's sprayed, it's difficult to to peel it back. So I think that it will allow for that or like i mean it already does but like i think uh, kind of these new immersive technologies will allow for like a, a shorter um um like, or like a, a, sh a shorter circuit circuit between the actualization of something and like the conception of something and like, i think this is like a great opportunity for 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 architects i think what i'm a bit um, hesitant or like where i'm uh, where, where I definitely see, like, I mean, I have been working at Arab for a long, for a long time, and like we had like a, a digital twin team that like was working very heavily on um, on on uh, on models for traffic simulation and so on. I think in my PhD or like as an as an architect or a designer, I think I want to find like a way of like using that not in a in not necessarily in like an optimization or engineering type of way, but to using this idea of the digital twin in a, in a generative way that like can be um, maybe opens up new ways for for designing um, with yeah complexity and unpredictability.
No, I, I just to say that I think it, this is precisely the kind of the, <clears throat> the the benefit of having a realm like this where we can share ideas on a platform because otherwise, you know, typically doctoral researchers are operating in isolation somewhere. We can we can we can um, we can make it all work together, which I think is is uh, exactly what we want to do. So I would just say that the, the doctoral consortium, which we've been doing in the last few weeks, has got some really amazing. I, mean, I haven't really digested it either, I mean, but there are some incredibly provocative kind of comments about reality and simulation and everything right now it's become such a hot topic and i think it goes alongside the metaverse and makes it much more interesting from the theoretical perspective because otherwise what is the metaverse it's just you know, it's what we've been doing already you know um so uh, so th thank you and I, I look forward to some discussions i think you've got some very provocative ideas uh there that um uh very interesting we've got a few questions in the chat um uh, which uh i'm just looking at, at the, the the questions themselves um I'll maybe I'll just go through them one by one. Um, there's a question here from Libish M. I don't know what that means. Um, what challenges we might face on developing such haptic interfaces, i.e. factoring health implications, the time limits for usage on site, and the reliability of such an interface? Um, let me read that again. What challenges might we face on developing such haptic interfaces, in, um, for example, factoring health implications, the time limits for usage on site, and the reliability of such an interface? Um, I guess that's a question for Daniela. Uh, yes, I'm trying to reread. I think, uh, well, the interface that I was using, it was just, it was controller-based. Um, the feedback that I got from construction worker was not that much the problem of, of having controller-based interface, but they actually wanted more. So it's, what is very interesting is multi-sensory interfaces. I think this is something that will become more and more a topic. That means that you don't just have one stimuli, but you have multiple. Um, this is for the for the, the test tracking. For the augmented reality, I think, I mean, I was working a lot with head-mounted displays. I have to say head-mounted displays are difficult to work for a long period of time. Um, that's why I use a lot of projection-based augmented reality. I think that has a huge advantage because it allows you to go away and enter it without actually having new devices. Screen-based and phone-based augmented reality has huge advantages. And if you already see this, these devices are already used on a construction site. No one is, construction workers make snapshots of the plans and bring the phone, already look at it. If that is now an app or if that is a screenshot of an already existing plan, nothing that much will change. So, but I think it has what kind of device you're using and how it's kind of influencing uh, uh, your interaction on, on site has a huge, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the, 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 the breaking point of a project. So if you make something that you cannot wear for seven hours or that people don't want to wear for three weeks in a row, uh, it won't work. So I think especially the research on these uh, interfaces and also using the interfaces for a longer period of time on site, outdoors, um, I think that's, that is kind of where we need to invest a lot of time of our research. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. <clears throat> um, there's a comment, the question on the, in the chat here, is there research in uh, DBT, particularly looking at the connecting 3D printed parts, pretty, like tenon joints? Is there research in DBT, particularly looking at connecting 3D printing parts like tenon joints? Um, at the moment, um, exclusively focusing on that, there is not. But uh, this uh, question of connecting 3D printing parts is something that has come up in various uh, research um, uh, projects in DBT. So, for example, if you look into the work of Hinscon Kwon, um, or Andre Zipa, they are also um, um, uh, trying to create larger structures from 3D printing of 3D printed objects, and um, yeah, they are also facing uh, this question of how to form these connections. Okay, um, then there's a question from Zhu Zhang. Um, uh, um, also in the chat, just in case I didn't read properly. Thanks for the presentations. I would like to ask Joanna a question based on her slides about the connection surface. How to make the connections tight and secure? Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, uh, you have identified the hardest part <laughs> uh, into the assembly of these pieces. So, indeed, uh, creating those connections is very difficult. 
Um, because as everyone who has once 3D printed knows, 3D prints deform. So what you have designed and what you get is always slightly different. And this deformation is already hard to predict for planar slicing. When we start using uh, curved layers, then it becomes like almost impossible to anticipate what kind of deformation we are going to have. Uh, so what we are doing at the moment is we are designing the connections so that once these deformations happen, once we get these inaccurate parts, um, the, the connection still doesn't fail. So we're always um, creating possibilities for tolerance. And the way we are connecting them at the moment, we, yeah, we started with hot glue and I don't recommend it. This was just like the quick and dirty way to see if things fit together. But at the moment we are creating mechanical connections. So we are using either um, metal screws or other metal connectors. And this works a lot better. Um, yeah, but in general, this uh, question of how to connect 3D printed parts is uh, definitely a, a big challenge in all projects. Um. Thank you. I'm just wondering if there are any questions we haven't asked um, from the chat. Have you any questions we don't ask? Yeah, I think there's a question for uh, Bharat. Uh, there are two questions actually for him. Um, one is um, in terms of the heat transfer rate, how does the new technology differ from the traditional metal pipes? So, Bharat, do you have any uh, comments on that? Yeah, I actually just typed out an answer. So if you want to copy paste it onto yeah, the yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll put that on the YouTube. There's also a follow up second question for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I saw that too. Um, so the first question, yeah, obviously metal uh, the, is a much better thermal conductor than polymers. So um, the performance of a metal pipe is way better than a polymer pipe, but the ratio of the thermal conductivity of the polymer pipe to the metal pipe, um, I mean, sorry, the ratio of the thermal conductivity of the heat pipe to the base material is similar for both polymers and metals. So the, the efficiency is very similar. And because we're able to print ultra thin walls, like less than a millimeter um, thick, the reactivity or the reaction time of the 3D printed polymer pipes um, uh, are similar to the metal conventional alternatives. And the second question, um, yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, you could manipulate the performance of the prototypes that we created by um, predetermining the temperature at which you want to transfer heat at. And so you can alter the vacuum pressure based on that. But where it gets interesting is that you could um, also Kind of engineer the heat capacity or how much heat you want to transfer through these heat pipes by the geometry and the surface area of the 3D printed uh, pipes. So I think that's where it gets interesting with uh, 3D printing and digital fabrication. So I'll copy that answer as well so you could paste it. Okay, I think, I think it I think we're we're um, we're in a situation where we should wrap up. I mean, it's, it's very late for Philip in uh, in Shanghai. I think it's half past midnight now. Um, <laughs> this is this has certainly been a um, a really productive session, and I think incredibly um, interesting in terms of kind of the the kind of work that's been put out there and the kind of connections that are developing and the discussions that are happening. I think have been very rewarding. I think it's great to have Philip here today to talk about his experiences in Shanghai and compare them to yours. And uh, certainly Agostino's work is, is very provocative and I'd love to keep up the conversation in some way um, with him. Um, I just let me to, maybe I can just uh, share my screen a second and, and uh, uh, mention briefly just what we have coming up over the next uh, the next 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 week. I mentioned at the very beginning uh, that we have a, a, a Farsi session on Friday, um, followed by a Portuguese tutorial session um, on Saturday. Now, what I also meant to mention is that everything we're doing, including the session today, is going to be put up on our, to our, our YouTube channel. The, the address is here. Uh, if you can do a screen capture or just Google it, Digital Futures um, YouTube, but we have um, everything is, is, is there. Um, and you can see what is actually delightful about this is the, the number of people who have been watching this. We've all got over 10,000 people watching your Shabak session in AI, Europe, Neuroscience and Architecture. I feel that we're beginning to have a real impact on the world. Um, and so too with our clay printing session um, 
28,000, which is quite astonishing. Um, uh, let's see how many we get for this particular session, but we can see that also that MIT Media Lab and, and the ICD Stuttgart uh, sessions have, have been very successful. Um, so it's great that we've, we've found this platform to, to create this kind of debate that's going on. Um, we, uh, in, in a few weeks time, uh, end of June, June, beginning of July, will, the summer events will happen. Philip is organizing a series of lectures as part of the doctoral consortium. We'll also have a series of workshops and so on. If anybody wants to come and join and help the team, um, we are recruiting uh, assistance because we need a lot of hands on deck. So at the bottom here, info at digitalfutures.world. Yeah, um, please, uh, if you want to come and join the team, um, you're most welcome. We are very uh, excited about the summer. Um, we'll be operating, as I mentioned, in terms of languages this year. We're developing further our uh, language channels. So um, anyway, I'd just like to finish off by uh, thanking everyone today and, and not just thanking um, the, the, those who've been uh, presenting and also uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the team behind setting things, these things up, but, but everyone. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into this um, and maybe you're not aware of that, but uh, um, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an effort that goes into it. So thank you for, for everyone. Nicola, thank you so much for the introduction. That was really very helpful. And, and I think, you know, this is hopefully just kind of really consolidating a platform whereby discussion among doctoral researchers around the world, you know, we can have this kind of continuous discussion. I think this is really the purpose of bringing the world together. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. I don't know if Philip, you've got a final word you want to say uh, before we, we sign off. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so see, see you next week and thank you again for everyone and thank you to the team and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.